So, I'm sure many of you would have seen, or at least heard of, the cult classic Jennifer's Body, starring Megan Fox herself. Well, I'm about to blow your mind. internet and welcome to episode 9 of Makeup and Mayhem True Crime with the me, Bala Monsoon. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime and discovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. So what that means is that every single True Crime Thursday or Freaky Friday, I release a brand new video that looks at the potential psychological motives behind a real life crime and delves a little bit deeper into understanding the motives behind what drove people to do what they did. So during these episodes, I also try to share some psychological concepts and ideas that relate to the episode itself, which you may or may not be aware of. So just a quick disclaimer for today's story. Today's story contains material that may not be suitable for all audiences as there is subject matter citing graphic violence, the occult, necrophilia and sexual assault. As always, as the story progresses, I will issue further warnings. I mean, absolutely no disrespect to the victim mentioned nor her family, and the purpose of this video is purely to educate and to spread awareness on the heinous crime that was committed. This story, as always, has been thoroughly researched by myself and contains real-life accounts and footage from individuals who were involved directly in the case. So, without further ado, on to episode 9. So, I'm sure many of you would have seen, or at least heard of, the cult classic Jennifer's Body, starring Megan Fox herself. Well, I'm about to blow your mind. So, before I go any further, I just want to state for the record that it has not been officially confirmed by anyone who worked on the Jennifer's Body movie that it was officially inspired by this event. I think for them to actually confirm that might be a little bit macabre and also it just might not sit well with individuals. However, I'm going to leave it up to you, the audience, to decide whether or not you think that this movie was indeed inspired by the story I'm about to tell you. I would love to hear your thoughts, so please do let me know at the end of the video. So, if you're interested in knowing more, then keep watching. So, picture this. The year is 1995 in Arroyo Grande, California. So, at the time, the area was a hotspot for gang crime, with shooting and stabbings almost being a regular part of life. In 2021, though, things are incredibly different there now, with mostly an older crowd living there in peace and quiet. However, back in the day, it was a completely different world, and within a population of around 14,000 people, there were at least a hundred violent crimes reported in a year, which was incredibly significant at that time. Elise Marie Paula was born on April 24th, 1980. She was a lively and friendly girl who was active in sports and theater, and she was even part of the church choir. So her dream job was to one day become an actress. However, as she became a teenager, she began to rebel like many others her age. So she began smoking and drinking and she found herself in trouble quite often with her parents and even at one stage she got in trouble with the school as she had pitched up to school under the influence. So it was at this point in time that her parents decided that this was enough and they wanted to get her help. So they signed her up to a rehabilitation center and that was the Mariposa Community Recovery Center. So on the 22nd of July, however, Elise decided to sneak out of her family home once again and this time she decided to meet up with a group of her guy friends and this decision would turn out to be a fatal mistake. So 
It wasn't as though these boys were strangers, she actually knew two out of three of them. So Jacob de Lashmat, who was 15 years old at the time, she had actually met quite recently at the Mariposa Recovery Center where they had both been receiving treatment for their substance and alcohol abuse. Jacob was the son of devout Mormon parents, however he was quite well known to always be a boy who was in trouble. Where she knew Jacob from rehab, she actually had met Joseph Fiorella, who was 14 years old at the time, at her school, where they had both attended. This was until he had left. So Royce Casey, who was the third boy and who was 16 years old at the time, she didn't know personally, but he was a friend of the other two boys. He was actually attending a nearby continuation high school after he was kicked out of his own high school. So together these boys were kind of known as social outcasts or loners and they would often get together, use drugs and get into trouble. So it was on this night that Elise had snuck out of her home. She had shoved some pillows under her duvet cover to make it look as if she was sleeping. And she had gone off to party with these boys as they had led her there under the pretense that they would be smoking marijuana and they would be having a party. So these three boys, as I mentioned, were between the ages of 14 and 16 years old and they actually played in a local band called Hatred. There was also a fourth member, I will mention him a little bit into the story. He was not there on the night though. So their band was largely inspired by a death metal hard rock band named Slayer. This band had albums that had songs with lyrics about the devil and sacrificing virgins. So Joseph, who was the youngest, he was 14 years old, remember, he also apparently had several books on Satanism and the occult. And this was all told in later accounts by Royce. So unbeknownst to Elise, these boys had actually been plotting her demise for a few weeks prior to the actual incident. So let's get into it. So as I mentioned, for over a month before the actual murder, these boys, these three boys, had been plotting and planning the murder. So at a later stage, when Jacob spoke to the authorities, he made mention of how things had started off seemingly harmless and innocent, with them playing guitar, smoking weed, and listening to heavy metal music. So this had soon escalated to them using harder drugs, and the boys had even started skipping school to go to an old drainage pipe which they had nicknamed the pipe of death and there they would do their drugs. So at this time the main drugs they were using were weed, acid and speed. Then one day Joseph had asked a question that would ultimately change everything. So Joseph had approached Jacob and had asked him if he would be down for sacrificing a whatever, a virgin. So Jacob had obviously not taken it seriously and he had just replied, whatever. So despite the fact that Joseph was actually the youngest, he was the one with the widest array of knowledge on Satanism and the occult and he had many books on the subject matter and he had also studied the work of a Satanist like Aleister Crowley, for example. In addition to this, it was also said that he was apparently obsessed with Elise. During later accounts, it came out that they would get together, they would listen to death metal, and they would discuss how they were going to sacrifice Elise to the devil. So they had picked Elise in particular based on what they thought would appease the devil. So Royce had said she had blonde hair and blue eyes and because she was a virgin she would be a perfect sacrifice for the devil. He then went on to state that therefore harming her would be considered the ultimate sin against God thus ensuring their ticket to hell. Okay, so at this point you may be asking, but why do they need to sacrifice someone in the first place? 
Good question. So they believed by completing this sacrifice, the devil would reward them and their band hatred. So these boys later went on to say that they were inspired to commit this sacrifice to the devil by the band Slayer whose songs about devil worship and sacrifice kind of spoke to them. So they therefore decided and got it into their minds that they would need to commit a sacrifice to the devil which would give their garage band hatred the craziness that they needed to go professional. So really they believed that after the sacrifice they would be able to play harder, play faster and their guitar skills would be better. So they later stated that they were apparently heavily influenced by the Slayer song Altar of Sacrifice amongst others where the lyrics go something along the lines of High Priest awaiting dagger in hand spilling the pure virgin blood. Okay, okay, let's just step out of there for just one second to quickly explain the concept of a satanic panic. So, in America, during the 1980s and 90s, there was a rise in what would later be termed satanic panic. So, in essence, the satanic panic is a moral panic about the alleged widespread satanic ritual abuse. So, in essence, if you want to understand that in a really simple way, a lot of things were being attributed to satanism that weren't all satanism at the time. So essentially anything that was deemed not the norm and not what was expected in society could often be attributed to Satanism and the term of Satanism kind of became a little bit muddy and murky and so this peaked in the early 90s, however then it began to drop as ultimately the law enforcement officers were debunking the claims and there was much skepticism from academics. However, by this period of time, this phenomenon had spread around the world and most recently it has still been seen periodically in South Africa. So South Africa has been quite particularly associated with the phenomenon of satanic panic for one main reason and this was because in 1992 the occult related crimes unit was established and upon being created it was described as the world's only ritual murder task force. So to this day there is still very many cases of satanic panic that you can find right here in South Africa. Anyway as I was saying, in later interrogations, Royce had mentioned to authorities how Jacob, Joseph, and a third boy, Travis, do you remember Travis? I mentioned him earlier. He was the fourth member of the band Hatred. So these three boys had plotted and attempted to kill Elise in another time prior to July. So it turned out that the boys had previously asked Elise to go on a walk with them and they had led her to the edge of a steep ravine on the mesa. So the one boy, Travis, had pretended to slip down the ravine and he had tried to get Elise to come down after him. Joseph had then apparently pulled out a knife, he had thrown the knife to Travis and apparently him and Jacob had then started chanting, do it, do it do it. Elise must have thought that the boys were just messing around because she never reported the incident and she still did trust them enough to go out with them on that fateful night. So Jacob told authorities that during that point on time they would regularly take acid and meth. So the mixture of dabbling in the occult and using hard drugs resulted in turning their warped fantasies into a disturbing reality. So just a warning, I'm about to go into the details of the crime. If you would like to skip this section as there are some graphic descriptions, then I will leave a timestamp on screen where you can skip to. After spending the evening with her family and pretending to go to sleep, she then stuck a bunch of pillows 
in her bed and she snuck out of the house to go and meet the boys. So the evening had started off with the four of them drinking and smoking marijuana at the eucalyptus grove on the Nepomo Mesa. At some point in the evening though, Jacob had taken off his belt and he had wrapped it around her neck. Then Royce had lunged at her, holding down her arms and her legs. It was however Joseph who had pulled out the hunting knife and he began to stab her in the neck. Jacob and Royce had then taken turns stabbing her. And all this entire time, Elise was praying and calling out for her mother. It was at this point that the boys came to the conclusion that Elise was not dying quick enough for their liking. So they then decided to start stomping on her neck to try and end her life quicker. So it was later established by the forensic pathologist that although the boys had stabbed her over 12 times, every single one of these stab wounds was a non-fatal wound, which thus meant that she had actually died from blood loss, bleeding to death slowly. So it was at this point whilst I was researching this story that I thought to myself, okay, well, the worst is over. But I was sorely mistaken. So after Elise had died, they then dragged her body to a quieter part of the eucalyptus grove. And it was at this point that they took turns raping her dead body. And as though this was not bad enough, they would then later over the next eight months continue to return to her decomposing body to have sex with it. So Jacob had actually boasted about returning to have sex with the corpse and between the three of them they had actually told several acquaintances about what they had done but no one had believed them and it was dismissed as a fabrication. So soon after Elise was reported officially missing however in the beginning the police and her family both believed that she had run away as she had had a difficult rebellious few months so there were also apparently physical sightings of her according to the hotline that was called and so these gave her parents hope that she was out there somewhere and she would return to them her grandmother had even put an ad in the newspaper hoping that she would read it. The ad had read, My dearest Elise, I miss you and I love you. Everyone is very worried and heartbroken because we don't know where you are. If you are happy, warm, well fed and healthy, I promise I don't want to drag you home or anything even like that. I just want us to sit down and talk and hug. There's nothing you can't tell me about how you feel, who's been cruel or unkind to you. We can work it out and you can stay with me until you want to go elsewhere. Please, please, just call me so we know you're alive. My love always, Nana. Unfortunately, that ad and that message would never be read by Elise. So this entire time, Elise's body had been less than a mile from her home, but it may have never been discovered if it wasn't for one of the boys, Royce, who came forward the next year, March 14th, and led authorities to the body. He then went on to tell them everything that had transpired that night in July. So in the months that had followed the murder, Royce had grappled a lot with his religion and his views, and ultimately he had turned towards Christianity and this had caused him to become quite estranged from the other two boys, which also was one of the factors that led him to come forward to the authorities. Another factor that had also caused him to come forward was that Jacob and Joseph had said that she wouldn't be the only one, there would be others. And he had assumed that they had meant him. And so he, fearing for his life, had also wanted to come forward and tell someone. So this all kind of started after the murder when he began to write in his journal. And he would often write about how he was fighting the other side. So in earlier accounts, Royce had actually wrote about how Satan had risen and was now reigning supreme. 
So he also believed that the devil would be more appeased if temples were erected in his honor and he also thought that serial killers would make the devil very happy. So he also wrote about how much he enjoyed going back and visiting the eucalyptus grove and admiring the evidence of spiritual supremacy. So this is an extract taken from his journal just three months after the murder. I'm fighting on the other side now, allied with the darkened souls. Satan's raised and shall conquer and reign. In the Bible, it says that in the end, Lucifer will bring out his best in everything. Music, love, murder. All the psycho serial killers and rapists don't know that they should just build an altar of sacrifice and kill the person on the altar and then have repeated sex with the corpse. Virgin meat is the ultimate sacrifice. You can't make this shit up. So in the end, all three pleaded no contest to the murder of Elise Parler and were sentenced to serve 25 years to life. Joseph Fiorella, who was 16 years old at the time, then received 26 years to life for first degree murder as part of a plea bargain with county prosecutors. So the three are currently being held at different prisons in California. So Royce is at the R.J. Donovan Correctional Center in San Diego. So Joseph, on the other hand, is at the High Desert State Prison in Susanville. And lastly, Jacob is at the Correctional Training Facility in Soledad. So Royce was denied parole at his first hearing in July 2016 and then again in 2018. However, he is to go before the board again according to the Department of Corrections and this is set to happen in 2021. So Joseph was up for parole no later than June of 2020 but I wasn't able to find any further information on whether he was granted parole or not and there was no information regarding Jacob's parole status. On a side note, Jacob's brother was also arrested three years later after he brutally murdered a minor for trying to steal his weed. What a charming family. But on a serious note, this episode has lacked a lot of the usual psychological insights I give. And the reason for that is that I couldn't find much information on the childhood of these boys growing up. So I wasn't able to actually dig a little bit deeper to try establish some of the factors that could have worked together that led up to this event. So after the murder came to light and the suspects were arrested, Elisa's parents filed a lawsuit against the band Slayer. And the reason for the lawsuit? Well, they claimed that the band's music incited the murder. This lawsuit went on to attract a lot of attention, both locally and internationally. However, the final verdict was not in Elisa's parents' favor. So in the presiding judge, Judge Jeffrey Burke's ruling, he stated that the lawsuit failed to prove that Slayer's lyrics and the music industry's marketing of death metal to young people violated California law. So during a later interview with the Washington Press, Jacob Delashmet had admitted, the music is destructive, but that's not why Elise was murdered. She was murdered because Joe was obsessed with her and obsessed with killing her. Joe, or Joseph Fiorella, continued to stand by his claim that he was fully influenced by Slayer's music. Fiorella had said, it gets inside your head. It's almost embarrassing that I was so influenced by the music. In a strange turn of events though, in a later interview with Entertainment Weekly, Joseph had then backtracked and he had gone on to say that Slayer's music had absolutely nothing to do with the murder of Elise Paula. And he was adamant 
that the murder was never intended as a satanic sacrifice. So it's really not known what spurred on this drastic change of heart, but it does leave very many questions to be answered. So this case was controversial to the music industry and the lawsuit that was filed threatened the idea of freedom of expression and speech. So over recent years, death metal, hard rock, and most recently video games have been blamed for causing and inciting violence within youth. So one of the more famous cases, which I am sure you would have heard of, was the Columbine shooting in 1999. So the two boys who had perpetrated the crime were said to have often played the video game Doom, which is said to have inspired their shooting spree. But this then begs the question, why out of thousands of individuals who played that game, did only two of them decide to turn it into real life? So murder and the inclination to harm have been around way longer than both video games and death metal combined. So on one end of the world, Herman Maggett, who was considered America's first serial killer, was active in the late 1800s. Whilst on the other side of the world, Jack the Ripper was notoriously active in London during the same time period. The unfortunate reality we must face though is that the propensity to cause harm is more likely as a result of a multitude of factors, with the addition of violent video games and music serving to potentially fuel an already lit fire. Multiple studies have also gone on to disprove that there is any correlation between violent video games and aggression in youth. So before I end off this video, I just want to say thank you so much for sticking with me this far. Thank you for supporting this video and thank you for supporting my channel. And if you're interested in all things crime, then please consider subscribing to my channel down below and hitting that notifications bell so you will stay up to date with my weekly uploads. But now let's get to the Bella bottom line. So I think it's both fascinating and disturbing that Jennifer's body, an almost comedic horror as per its own classification, would have such dark roots for its inspiration. So that brings me to my first question. So now that you've watched the whole episode, and if you have already watched Jennifer's Body, I now pose the question to you again. Do you believe that Jennifer's Body was influenced or inspired by the murder of Elise Parler? I would love to hear your thoughts. You can leave them in the comment section below. So within the real life case, the question still remains though. What was the real reason for the murder? Was it truly a satanic ritual? Or was the idea of death metal, satanic panic, satanic rituals and sacrifices just to cover for the real intention or obsession with Elise Parler? What do you think? So until next time my loves, stay safe, stay awesome and stay blessed.